um, your first page of notes. I'm going to open this up for questions in just a moment. Um, but your first page of notes, the language fundamentals, yeah, unit one, language fundamentals, <clears throat> it's got some basic terms and such. Those terms are lifted straight out of the first one or two chapters. I think it's chapter two, primarily. Um, yeah, primarily chapter two um, of your book, because as I said, I'm not discussing the book directly. The notes are kind of loosely based upon um, the book. So my hope is that you're still doing the assigned reading and supplementing that with the notes. For example, I talk about in the basic terms and such, you've got terms like sound shift, sound law, fricative, affricate, nasal. And on pages 22 and following of your book, consonants of current English. And your authors go on to describe those consonants. They describe them as alveolar, as fricative, as things like that. Now, some of those terms I have on here. Some of them I don't. But whenever you see something, and this doesn't apply just to this class. This applies to every class where you have a textbook that has terms in bold print. You ought to try to learn what those terms in, in um, bold print are. All right. Um, Eighty percent of them will not quote unquote show up on an exam, but some of them might. Okay, um, the ones that are more important for for us uh, are you know the particular ones that refer to how we make sounds: bilabial, lips, dental, teeth, etc. Palatal, roof of the mouth. Um, so you have, you know, things referring to place of articulation. I said you did not need to, you know, memorize, where is that chart? The chart on page 22 that shows you the uh, physiology of the mouth. You don't need to remember that. You need, you do need to know how sounds are made. For example, question might come up on the exam. What's the difference between a consonant and a vowel? You're all, everybody and almost everybody in here is an English major, and you've never thought about that. I'm not saying that that's bad, because you shouldn't necessarily walk around pondering the deep significance of the difference between a consonant and a vowel, but what, how are they different? Consonant has a stop of air. Is it a total stop? It's a loaded question. Might be. If it's a stop. Like tch, buh, buh. Those are those are those sounds called stops. But what about mmm? Uh, it's not a total stop. Okay. But with a consonant. I think this is somewhere in here on page 25 or so. With a consonant, you have an impeding of the flow of air. Okay? With a vowel, it's not impeded. It's modified by where the tongue is and how the mouth is opened and closed. Okay? Uh, or the nasal cavity, possibly. But with a consonant, it's it's impeded. It's um, obstructed in some way. Mm. It's being obstructed here, right? Right? Ooh. It's kind of being obstructed. It's being forced to go around, you know, the sides, the sides of your mouth for consonant. Okay? Vowel, it's unobstructed. A, E, I, O, U. Notice, your mouth doesn't close at all. For those. For most of the consonants, there is some closure somewhere in your mouth. Mm, mm, t, g, oh, 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 oh. I mean, you can figure out what's going on, right? <clears throat> so, I mean, that's just a little 
examples, the kind of stuff that's in the book that we have not spent a great deal of time um, talking about. Because usually when I've taught this class, we haven't had time. I'm still trying to wrap my head around how we are about three weeks ahead. Um, I don't know if I've forgotten something to go over, but I don't think I have. Um, okay. Pardon? Well, if I've forgotten about it, it's probably not going to show up on the exam. And I've brought with me, where did I put them? Three previous exams. Um, going back, because I'm weird this way, going back as far as 2001, right? Um, which I'll, I'll put a couple of these up just to show you, because somebody asked, you know, what does your exam look like? And this will give you an idea of what they'll look like, to, of what it'll look like to some extent, okay? I mean, there might be a little bit of modification, but I think I already told you. What are some things you can expect to show up? Man. The Germanic tree. In fact, we can go back and just say the language trees. But this one, you need to know all of. Okay? For... All of the language trees, if a tree shows up on the exam, it won't be blank. That is, I won't just have lines. And then the horizontal things, it says one, two, and you fill those in. Some of those will be filled in to help jar your memory, okay? And it will be the ones that were in your notes, not the one that I had up. I still don't understand how that happened. Um, up there, okay? The vowel triangle that's in the first couple pages of your notes, that will show up. That will probably be mostly blank. Okay? So it'll look something like this, and it'll have something like that. And most of those will be blank, and you put in what goes where. Okay? Um, what else did I say you would be expected to be able to do? Yeah, not write it out loud, but either you'll have something like this, or you'll have this. This, write in modern English, this, write in phonetic transcription. It's the same word. This is hill. If this were that, what could it be? And I might say, you know, in your phonetic, if you if there's a phonetic transcription, spell it, you know, in standard non-southern dialect English, because this is not this, unless, again, you're a southerner, or depending on a certain, certain part of the south, heel, you know, in other words. Uh, but some of these could get kind of hard. For example, Drawing a blank on the symbol I used for Composition. Okay. It's in, it, if I have something like that, I might do this, put a dash to break the syllables to make it a little bit easier. Okay. That's probably about as long as you will see. Is that four syllables? Yeah. Uh, probably four syllables as long as any 
maybe five, but there would probably only be one word on there, okay? But it, it might be like this, or it might be like this, or it might be a mixture of the two, okay? So you, you need to be familiar with that phonetic alphabet that's on the notes, <clears throat> which is pretty much the same phonetic alphabet that is used in the text of your book. Now, they do give you on page 36, differing transcriptions, okay? Um, and these differing transcriptions are just for some of the sounds. But you'll notice the ones that I use in the simplified form are included here. Um, for example, here's a list of some symbols used in this book, but variants you'll find elsewhere. So there's the, where is it? The S with the little kohachek on top of it for the sh sound. Well, there's another symbol that is used elsewhere. If you open it up to this part, or that's the one there. Uh, they used to have it on both end covers. Okay? This gives you the entire international phonetic alphabet. But this is way too complex for our purposes. So I give you a much simplified form. Question. Yes? Um, all I have to admit, I just wanted you to know, uh -huh. one version of the word and one Wikipedia, one had it and it printed out. It was Use P the PDF version is the one that retains the <coughs> fonts that I embedded in the document. With Word, and, and again, this applies to any class you have, if you download a Word document that a professor uploads, if your computer does not have the same fonts that were used in that document, Word will try to supply something similar. Well, there isn't anything similar to this, which is why I did the PDF. That way, it automatically is retained, okay? So, I probably just shouldn't, you know, include Word, Word um, files from now on. Starting from here on out, I'll just do the PDF version. Other questions? What about the maps? What do you mean the maps? Those, those are um, visual aids rather than things to memorize. You mean like the, the uh, migration maps? Yeah, you don't need to know those. For example, the first three, I think, that were included were maps that were showing the diffusion, the migration patterns for the Kurgan hypothesis. What's important there is the Kurgan hypothesis. Okay? Those are just demonstrations of how that hypothesis kind of worked out and how the proto and european peoples migrated from their original homeland. Same thing with the second one with the Anatolian, and then the third one with the um, Gamkrelidze and Ivanov. I don't think there's a specific single word phrase like this for Kurgan Anatolian. It's not called the Az Azerbaijanian, but modern day Azerbaijan is where they say was the um, proto and european homeland. about Grimm's Law? <laughs> that would be best, okay? Um, I was going back through my old exams, and I've, I've been pretty consistent on this, and I think I'm going to change it a little this time. Um, because this has also pretty consistently been the exam most students have done the worst on. Historically, over... 25 years of teaching this course. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is Grimm's Law. So I'm not going to just say, no. describe for me the first step in Grimm's Law in a sentence, write a formula, give me examples, which is what I used to do. And then second step and third step. The whole thing ended up being worth like 25 points, which is about one fourth of the entire exam. I'm not going to do that, okay? I will have all three steps. That is, there will be a, a section for all three steps, but it'll be more like these. Part of it, parts of it would be blank. So it might have step one, Indo-European aspirated voice stops become Proto-Germanic. 
and you fill in that. And then um, it might have, let's say, one or two <coughs> of the sound changes represented formulaically. In other words, and then I might have, you know, that and that. That is, one or the other two. So, one of them will, at least one of them, I will say, will be given. The other two might not be. In this instance, okay? Um, the second one, you know, the third one will probably be the same. But the second one might not be where I give you half the sentence, but it might be I give you the formula, and you write the sentence. That is, you write, you tell me what... Um, this means, okay, or you tell me what, you know, if I have something like, um, That's a formula. That's not a sentence. And this is showing this becomes this. So I might give you this and say, give me the sentence that tells me what's happening. Well, it's not much different, right? You would write out, Indo-European voice aspirated stops become Proto-Germanic, etc., etc. Look at your notes as an, as an example there. I think that's... Um, Unless I'm completely misremembering them, which, because of lack of sleep last night. So, the first page of your notes, Grimm's Law, step one. Indo-European aspirated voice stops, but Doug, huh, became Proto-Germanic, da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, and that's, I'm sorry, this is why I was confused. Where did I put that word? There it is. This... Either doing it this or that, that. That's the sentence. This is the formula. Okay. So, so, yeah, I can, I was bring it. This is the sentence. Indo European voice aspirated stops either with an arrow or the word be, this become. Become proto Germanic voice aspirated stops. That's the sentence that describes it. So, what's a formula that shows it? Well, here's one. Okay, this is the first sound. What's the next one, for example? And, and they're not in order. That is not like this is the very first. Okay? That becomes that. This one? Yeah, you got to get the, that's the aspirated part. That's the formula. Okay? And I might give examples. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to ask you for examples, okay? So I might have Indo-European, um, I don't remember what the example is, it's something like Gester becomes Proto-Germanic, what, Dost, H drops out, etc. right? So you've got... On the first page of notes that talks about Grimm's Law, and then the second part with the uh, seven characteristics of Germanic languages, okay? You've got um, somewhat long sentence, okay? Followed by formula, which is just showing this, just showing this, the sound change, followed by example. So, what might show up on the exam is, take, well, let me show you what might show up on the exam. Something like this. It's coming down. Let's go dot cam. Show to class.
for you showing to class. Yes, you are showing to class. We're going to put that there. It is. So, let me see. Um, that's one where I didn't include Greg's Law. So, you know, this was a this was a hard one. This is the kind that probably will not show up. Because what am I asking for here? Step one, where, where you see step one, that's where you write the sentence. Okay? What will show up on yours will probably be for each of these. It might be part of the sentence will show up. It might be there will be none of the sentence, but you'll have part of this showing up. Okay? So you'll have part of the formula. And based upon that, you ought to be able to reproduce what the sentence is doing. Because any one of these individual formulae, any one of these individual elements, should be enough to jog the memory to explain this. Okay? Now, like, like I said, this total blank, that's not going to show up. I'm trying to see if I have one where I did include some of it. And I don't in the exams. Um, hold on a second. One, two, that goes right there. And that. So here's what you have. So think of this. Think of it looking something like that, <clears throat> without any examples, so none of the examples, but let's skip those two since I can reach this one. Um, I might have step three. You might have this part, and you fill in this part, okay? and, or you might have this this and the next one and you fill in all of this because if you can see oh, I don't have all that on that same page do I let me use this one instead yeah that one because if you can see this to this and you realize what the sounds are okay but voice stop, unvoiced, okay, stop, and you say duh to tuh, voiced stop to unvoiced or voiceless stop, guh to voiced to unvoiced or voiceless, then you, that should jog the memory enough to say, okay, so Indo European voice stops become proto Germanic voiceless. So, you might have this part, but not this. You might have this, and then you have to fill in this. Okay? Or you might have this, and you fill in this, and you might have ba, da, and ga, and you have to show me what ba becomes, and da becomes, and ga becomes. Right? So, there's, there's, I'm trying to give myself some, some flexibility and not telling you exactly what it's going to um, to be. Is that clear? I'm saying yes and no and so. What's not clear? I'm still having a hard time on going around Grimm's Law altogether. Okay. Okay. So, um, forgive me for... No, it's okay. <laughs> Am I understanding that what I need to retain and memorize are basically the first two lines your example in the notes of steps one, two, and three, and the rest of it are just examples of what you're giving. These are just examples of these sound changes. Yes, that's all these are. Okay. So the the three things that come after the sentence and the formula, 
the three lines that come after that are merely examples, real world, actual, not theoretical examples of those sound changes. So for example, look at this, this just number two. If you understand what's happening from here to here, then Pisces and fish make sense. And, yeah, you don't have to I'm not about that. It's just, it's, yeah. distinguish, try to distinguish between memorize and learn. They're not necessarily the same thing. And I'm, I'm one of those old-fashioned people who is all for rote memorization. I mean, rote memorization, just simply memorizing facts, dates, is a really, really good way of learning. Because what that does, that gets stored in the mind, and then later on you're doing something else, and there is a factoid that is suddenly relevant, okay? M memorizing, just flat out memorizing this will stick in your mind, and you'll be reading some time in the future, you know, as uh, Robert Frost says, ages and ages hence, and... Thinking with a sigh, hmm, I get that, because maybe you're picking up, you're learning another language somewhere, Latin, whatever, and you start to see some parallels between Latin and Greek. This is why, you know, I would argue every English major ought to take Latin, period. Just, just buckle down and take it. Not because English is based on Latin. I mean, there are romance language professors who will kind of assert that. It's not. But because so much of our English language, one, borrowed Latin, we'll be talking about next week when we get into Old English period, but two, so many of our English words are cognate with Latin words. So that if you understand Latin, you'll be able to pick up a lot of non-native English words, okay? Words that have been borrowed as well as see similarities because we still because this is a reality this isn't just something some egghead philologist or linguist made up some theory that may or may not have any basis in reality the reason Grimm kind of formulated this law was he said this happens consistently okay? there's there's as I said, a couple of exceptions, and we don't talk about them in this class for the simple reason, one, it becomes much too confusing because of those exceptions, and two, they aren't major, you know, violations of the law, so to speak. Okay. Yep. Other questions? History of writing? The order? Pre-writing, proto-writing, real writing, difference between ideographic and pictogra pictographic, analytical script, you know, a little bit of mixture of, of the two, where the alphabet comes from. Again, in there the notes might be, the notes might include a little bit more than what is included in your book about some things, okay? The book is really good about tracing specifically the development of the Latin alphabet. It doesn't go as much into the runes, any trust in and that kind of stuff, um, or the, the punctuation as I do um, in the notes. But why is that important? Because we couldn't do any of this if it weren't for writing. That's why it's important. Languages that do not have a written alphabet, we cannot trace their history, period, because it only exists up here, right? So a lot of these languages, you know, a lot of languages in the world that don't have alphabets, we, we don't know what their quote-unquote history was. We do know English is, why? Because we can trace it to its earliest form, earliest Germanic form, Gothic, and then from Gothic and all the other Germanic languages, languages, we can kind of postulate what Proto-Germanic looked like, and we can look at then the Germanic languages with all the other Indo-European languages, and go back to the Proto-Indo-European, um, etc. 
from here on out, or after Tuesday, we probably won't discuss any of this. Why? Because we'll be into, quote-unquote, real English. This is all, I think the notes have backgrounds. This is all, you know, dim, foggy memory of English. We're going to be moving into not-so-dim, not-so-foggy memory, even though it's old English and it hasn't been spoken for a thousand years. Okay? But it's real English. It's when English literature begins. It's, you know, parts of it are recognizable as real English. You'll, as we go through, you'll be able to see individual words, nouns, adverbs, adjectives, verbs, etc., and say, yeah, that's English. And one of the things we'll do as we go on is, okay, so what happened to it? That'll be other issues. Um, but this is, this is the foundation. This is the bedrock upon which everything else follows. Right? Other questions? You started to go over what we were going to mean by the examples with characteristics of Germanic language. Mm -hmm. Um, it might be as simple as name the seven characteristics, name the seven distinctive characteristics of, of the Germanic languages. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, shared common distinctive vocabulary. I'm not going to ask for an example. Okay? Two tense verb system. Weak verbs. Form, past tense, how? With a dental suffix. Yeah, you need to know all of that part about weak verbs. Because that's going to be really important when we get to the Old English period. Because it's the difference between weak and strong verbs that often confuses students an awful lot. We don't use the terminology today, weak and strong, do we? What do we use? For weak, we use regular. For strong, we use Irregular. Why do we call strong verbs irregular? Because their vowels change, and they don't all change the exact same way. That is, one vowel, one verb, an A might change to an O to go to past tense. In other ones, an I might change to an A. It's irregular in that sense. Okay? Grimm just used the terms weak and strong. Regular, irregular come after Grimm. By... American, I can't remember, it might be Noel Webster. I think it is Noel Webster, okay? Um, or about the same time as Grant. Um, so, weak verbs form a dental suffix, uh, form preterite tense, past tense, with the dental suffix, t or d, okay? Proto Germanic had a system of weak and strong adjectives. What's the difference between a weak adjective and a strong adjective? Bingo! A weak adjective is always preceded by a demonstrative pronoun or um, definite article. That's it. That's the difference. It's not that one is sitting there kind of, you know, limp-wristedly lying halfway over going, oh, it's so weak. It's, it's just preceded by a definite article or a demonstrative pronoun. That's, that's the difference. Why? We don't know. We don't know why one has that and another one doesn't. And bear in mind, with the weak and strong adjectives, any adjective, every adjective, can be either weak or strong. What's it depend on? Who's leading it? Is there something before it or not? Something meaning an article of some kind, a demonstrative or a definite article. What else? Germanic languages have first syllable stress. Okay. All of them. Vowel shift from Proto Indo European to Proto Germanic. Okay. Now, on this part of the exam, if I'm just saying name the seven defining characteristics, I'm probably just going to ask 
strictly for what is in or underlined. Okay? But there might be a question, you know, describe the two vowel shifts from Indo-European to Germanic. Well, there's one. Short O becomes Germanic short A. Long A becomes Germanic long O. So notice, Indo-European short O, Germanic long A. Indo-European long A becomes Proto-Germanic long O. Okay? So if you think of it this way, You can draw a diagonal. Short A, uh, long A, uh, short O, uh, long O. Uh. Short O, uh, short A, uh, long A, uh, long O. Uh. Okay. And then the last one, Grimm's Law. You can put first sound shift, or you can just put Grimm's Law. Because where I ask you to explain or demonstrate Grimm's Law, that'll be another part. That'll probably be like the next question, or something pretty close to that, right? What else? I mean, the way to, the way to study for this is, one, to obviously have read the chapters. So if you're not done that, do that. Um, read the notes repeatedly. I mean, just read over them. Don't, don't read over and necessarily highlight and underline and put comments aside. Just keep reading them. I mean, they'll, they'll stick. Um, I've had a couple of people say, you know, they've been re-watching the class things on YouTube. Personally, I would find that boring, but others are saying, you know, it's, it's helpful because they're catching stuff that they didn't catch in class. Scribble notes away um, almost immediately. But everything that's done in class, when I've got notes up on the, the overhead, essentially, you know, what I'm doing is I'm merely amplifying. I mean, yeah, I often will read through what's there, but then I give additional examples, I expand upon it, um, that kind of thing, which there's no written, you know, background uh, to that per se. Other questions? Probably. Class is about an hour and a half long. Most of you will probably be done in under an hour. I mean, one of you will probably stay here for the full 85 minutes. One or, you know, usually there's one or two. Um, but there's always one person. Every, it doesn't matter what class I'm teaching. There's always one person who's done in 15 minutes. And I either know they either aced it or it's blank. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, one, it's usually one of those two. The first person out is not usually a C plus. It's either I know this stuff and you're a moron, Sherman, or I'm a moron and I will never know this stuff and I'm leaving now and I'm never coming back. You know, kind of, a, kind of a thing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be negative or anything. Don't be surprised if... Um, you do worse than you think or worse than you hope to do. But again, I'm going to try and mitigate that a little bit by uh, changing the, the structure of it a little bit. Um, but, you know, if when you get it back, you know, it's not what you had hoped for, don't think it's the end of the world because there's several more exams and this is probably the hardest material. I mean, the Germanic stuff. The Germanic stuff in the history of writing, just keeping it all kind of in a manageable order um, is hard. I mean, a lot of schools, the history of writing, that's an entire separate course. Just a course on the history of the quote-unquote English alphabet. Okay, um, Germanic philology, Germanic linguistics, or the just the English from Old English to Modern English is a class. And then you can have another class 
just on the Indo-European part. I mean, you can come, if you're interested in the Indo-European part, you can come to my office and I can show you a dozen books that are just Indo-European linguistics, okay? So, it's just background. We'll build on, um, on this. I mean, I'm even thinking of making this exam a little bit shorter than the others, so it'll be worth a little bit less points, so that the others will then therefore be a little bit more points, so that if you do bomb this one, it's not, you know, end of the world, so to speak. It's not going to be like, this is 10 points, and they're all 200 points, you know. Um, but maybe 75, I don't know. I'll figure something out. Other questions? Yes? I hate to already be this person, but are you going to be offering extra credit? <laughs> um, you know, I've thought about that. I haven't given a lot of thought of it, but I really should. Today's Thursday, right? Yeah, today's Thursday. How can I work this in as extra credit for this course? Yeah, I'll give extra credit. Here's one you can do. Uh, this might be the only one. I'll send this out by email later on today. And I know it's very, very last word. Um, tonight, starting tonight, MTSU, Nashville Shakespeare Festival, is doing Julius Caesar. Tonight, tomorrow, Saturday... Maybe Sunday afternoon. Um, I have no idea what it costs. Five, ten bucks, something like that. Probably. Go watch the play. Bring me, because I'm not going to see it. Um, bring me a copy of the program. That tells me you've seen the play. Um, and write up a, I don't know. One to two page double spaced review. Okay. Um, Shakespeare falls within the purview of the history of the English language, though they're not doing it in Shakespearean pronunciation. It would be nice if they did, but it would also be scary as hell <laughs> to hear what came out of their mouths. Um, yeah, so that's an extra credit possibility. And I'll just say off the top of my head, it'll probably be worth somewhere between 20 and 30 points. Okay? So if you if you do it, don't just, you know, the review, oh, I really like this, you know, a hundred times. Talk about the setting, talk about the acting, talk about the uh, enunciation where actors clear, talk about music, if there's music, there is, there always is with NSF productions. Um, if you're familiar with the play, talk about how they modify, what they cut, or, or I hate it when they do this, what they add. <laughs> I've seen a couple of NSF productions where they've kind of taken words from one character and given it to somebody else, etc. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's tonight. Um, Tucker, I think. Tonight, tomorrow night, Saturday night, and I think Sunday afternoon, but I'm not I'm not positive about the Sunday afternoon. I know it's tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday, because my wife's working tonight, my son's working tomorrow night, my wife's working Saturday night, um, collecting tickets or something. Do you know what time? Seven o'clock, I believe. The the production will start at either seven or seven thirty. They will um, begin about a half hour or hour before that with a 30 minute quote unquote talking Shakespeare will they have some um, Shakespeare expert um, I just forgot to answer the email uh, otherwise I'd be doing one of them um, talking about some aspect of the play maybe their product this particular production of it or something about Shakespeare's language that's often one of the things we'll talk about you know when we do one of these things what you should listen for um, in the play, and if you've never seen Julius Caesar, it's a great play. I mean, it's it's one of Shakespeare's really great tragedies. Um, I'm just not seeing this production um, because of what I know about it. I, I, I know I won't like it because I'm a I'm a purist when it comes to films, books translated to film, you know. Uh, so, Qu other questions. <laughs> uh, 
I love donuts. Uh, well, let's see, we're getting the we're doing the exam I on. We're doing the exam on. Well, that's not donuts. That's that's scotch. Um, I can do that too. That's cigars. Um, we're we're getting the exam on Tuesday. I'll probably have them back for you uh, the following Tuesday. Well, that's what it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah, won't be probably won't be Thursday. Um, probably be the following Tuesday, if I remember right. I want to say somebody has already told me they can't be here. They told me earlier in the semester that they won't be here that Tuesday. So I wouldn't have the exams back until I have all the exams. Other questions? Can you give like math Um, it'll depend on the kind of question. Um, if it's if it's simply you know, let me find one in here where I've got a two pointer. Um, none of those work. <laughs> Yeah, here's one. Name two of the four main kinds of linguistic typologies. That's worth, on this exam, I have no idea where this one was. That was worth four points. If you only gave one, that would obviously be worth two points. Okay? Um, some of the exam, you know, so there's an example of where you've got some words in phonetic transcription, you give me the things. Um, but some of the exam might be true, false. Okay. Some of it will be, you know, cuneiform is an example of blank writing. So you will fill in the blank there. Okay. There won't be any essay. You can't really do any essay on at least on this part. Maybe later on in the semester there, there will be. Um, so, short answer, fill in the blank, um, true, false, possibly, complete the chart kind of a thing. Um, what else? You know, you could see something like this. Where I give you the Old English, the translation, and this, and say, okay, which of those is weak and which is strong? Okay. And probably if I did that, okay, notice I've got the and the here. What? Modern English, we don't just say young men, you know, went to the store. I mean, you can't say young men went. But usually, the young men. We put a definite article there. If I was trying to get you to tell me what you know, difference between weak and strong adjective, I would probably put the in parentheses to show we kind of supply that. Right. Anything else? All right. Back there with your hands in prayer, you know. <laughs> You're free to go. This will be up later on this afternoon if you need to um